recording contracts with customers. If we flip to the next slide, um, my name is Jennifer McCahill and I'm an art partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors. I'll be moderating um, our presentation today. So I'd like to start off with just some quick housekeeping items that will explain what you need to do to earn CPE. So if you do want to earn CPE credit, um, you must complete and submit an evaluation at the end of the presentation. It will be emailed to you following our discussion. Additionally, we'll be giving um, CPE words throughout the presentation. You will need to write down these words um, and uh, put them into the survey uh, in order to receive your certificate. So we'll say the words once. Um, so just jot them down, make sure you're keeping track if you do want to earn CPE credit. If you have any technical questions or issues during the discussion, please use the questions function to speak with the administrator for assistance. Uh, we have provided the slide deck um, for today's discussion. It's available on our website and uh, we will, it's already been emailed to some of you, but again, if you haven't received that and need that, um, please reach out to us. And if there's technical support issues, um, on the previous slide, we've included Nathan's email address. So please reach out to Nathan if, if there are any issues with that. Today's learning objective is to provide you all with a better understanding of the complexities of revenue recognition and knowledge uh, nonprofit financial professionals will need to report under the new revenue recognition ASU topic 606. So we do ask to enhance the quality of our discussion today, especially within the breakout sessions. If you could please um, turn on your cameras and uh, keep them turned on. We, we would love to see your face. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, we, we're just so happy to have you on uh, on this snowy day. So we have a number of um, facilitators today. It's a great GRF team we've pulled together who are experts in this topic. So we'll all be helping navigate the conversation on a, a variety of examples. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so diving into just an overview of the ASU requirements, I think it's important just to high level talk about what the framework is before we get into deep dive examples um, and those breakout discussions on how you all are, are applying this in real life, how we, how we have seen the real life application throughout our, our client base. So although there are a number of ASUs that uh, address revenue recognition um, with contracts from customers, the the primary ASU that we'll be talking about and focusing on, it does roll into ASU 2014-09 or topic 606. And the effective date uh, for non-public entities uh, way back when was delayed a number of times. Um, and then December 31st, 2019 year ends, uh, were required to implement it um, until COVID hit. And then it was delayed yet another year. So we're now at the point where all fiscal year ends, uh, December 31st, 2020 and moving forward are required to implement this new revenue recognition standard. And remember that this standard isn't just for nonprofits, although that's where our, our focus is today. This is for publicly traded companies um, and there is um, an international standard equivalent. Um, so IFRS has issued IF IFRS 15, which is the same thing. So this is a worldwide change on how revenue is recognized. Um, but again, we'll be focusing the discussion on revenue streams for, for nonprofits. What, what it really aims to do is take what we, we like as accountants and type A, um, especially like myself, is a very rules-based 
uh, approach to re recognizing revenue, those bright line tests and very clear guidance on how to recognize revenue to a much more principles based that requires a lot of um, individual judgment. Um, so we see, we see organizations kind of struggle with that judgment piece and how best to come up and document uh, their specific rules um, since it isn't very clear cut anymore. And then before we talk about the actual um, uh, uh, topic 606, the framework, just keep in mind when we're when we're talking about revenue, we use the word consideration um, interchangeably. So the revenue is the consideration in which you'll in what you expect to receive for that transfer of promised goods. So we'll get into that in just a minute. So before, if we flip to the next page, before we um, dive in, we'll start with a polling question in the first CPE. Um, so the polling, were you an early adopter of topic 606 in your latest financial statements? So maybe you were one of the very prepared 1231 2019 year ends that had your audit very early and you were required to adopt it um, before that delay in COVID. But have you adopted it yet? Um, are you a pioneer or um, are you still navigating what needs to be done? So while we while you all answer the poll, uh, I am going to provide the first CPE word, which is audit. So if you do want to receive that CPE uh, credit, please do jot down the word audit, A-U-D-I-T. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of you that 23% that have adopted it, great. Um, and then the majority of you, 58% haven't. So that'll be great to be on this and see how your peers have um, navigated some of these requirements, the documentation thus far. So moving on, uh, so this quote, the core principle of the standard, um, you know, this tries to summarize what is hundreds of pages in, in guidance. But ultimately, Topic 606 tries to uh, depict that transfer of what you've promised as a good or service in an amount that reflects the consideration in what, in what you would receive. And so where we find that organizations struggle with this is that that revenue recognition, that transfer, that amount um, doesn't necessarily align with uh, other factors uh, that um, come into play. So it doesn't align with, you know, cash received, doesn't necessarily need to align with cash received, the accrual-based accounting, doesn't need to align with the payment schedule that's laid out in um, maybe that contract or a grant. It doesn't need to align with, you know, a, a 112th recognition. It could be something very different. So there are a lot of different factors that come into play um, when talking about when you're ultimately going to recognize the revenue versus when you might ha have received the cash or have a schedule of payment within the contract or things like that. So um, we'll help kind of determine how, how that'll be documented moving forward. So moving on, um, I think it's also important to note that topic 606 is one, is primarily for exchange transactions. Um, so before you even go down the path of applying this new revenue framework, you need to make sure that what you're applying it to actually is an exchange transaction. So just a reminder, an exchange um, means that each party is receiving something of approximate equal value versus a non-exchange or what we typically see as a contribution is one party is receiving something of value and the other party isn't receiving 
a commensurate amount in return. So those non-exchange transactions don't fall under topic 606. So when we're talking about contributions or donations um, or some grants, you know, those are going to fall under here uh, what we've referred to as ASU 2018-8. So those don't fall under topic 606. We're focusing primarily on those exchange transactions. On the next slide, we've given you some examples of the of what we see in exchange transactions, the ones that have come up most often as, um, as being streams of revenue that uh, our, our nonprofits need to uh, analyze against the new standard. So those membership fees, it's it, they're listed on the left-hand side here, sponsorships, grants and contracts. We've got examples of all of these that we're gonna uh, do a deep dive into. And um, the note on here about bifurcation is, is very important because, um, you know, when we're talking about these items, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? It's a membership fee uh, stream of revenue could have um, a contribution piece in it. So when we're looking at those revenue streams, we do need to break them out into the individual components. Um, and, and that's where that considerable judgment does come into play. The guidance does specifically exclude uh, some items. So we've provided them here. Lease contracts, insurance contracts, financial instruments are, are not applicable. Um, other guarantees. And then of course, what we've mentioned before when we're looking at contributions, those do not fall under topic 606. And we've provided you with uh, this great flow chart on that will help you determine whether you need to apply topic 606 to a revenue stream that you have. Um, so I'm not going to go into this, but this is a tool that you all can use just to even start um, and say, yes, I need to apply the new framework or no, you know, it's non-reciprocal, uh, non-exchange, and I'm going to apply the old contribution standards. Okay, we're going to go over the model uh, very quickly because, again, we really want to focus on um, the deeper dive into the examples and how to apply the model. But here is the new uh, five-step model, the crux of what Topic 606 is all about um, uh, in applying these five steps to, to your revenues. So let's flip to the next slide and, and just quickly go over. So step one is identifying whether you even have a contract with the customer. And so here we've just reminded you all that a contract is an agreement uh, between two parties um, that's enforceable and certain criteria must be met in this step to permit the revenue recognition. So there are, there are four sub uh, categories within this category that you must also meet I'll quickly chat on them. Um, it must have com commercial substance. There must be an approval and a commitment by each party to fulfill um, the contract. The payment terms and the rights have to be identifiable and it's probable that you'll collect. So, um, so within this, there are some subsections that you, that you do need to meet in order to permit revenue recognition. And then do remember that it, it doesn't always need to be in writing. A contract doesn't need to be in writing. It could also be um, verbal or it could be implied throughout the normal course of a business practice. So I think that's important too, because that adds a layer of complexity when going through these steps. Step two, it, so within that contract, you've determined step one that you actually do have a contract. The next step would be to identify those performance obligations within the contract. So if you have one performance obligation, it makes it relatively um, easy. It makes it straightforward. Where it gets a little murky um, and where we see step two and three, that judgment coming into play, is when you have multiple performance obligations, or in this case, it, what we define that obligation as a promise to give the customer a good or a service, right? 
And in some instances, it can be a multiple, it could be a bundle of goods and services. I've promised to do five things within um, this contract that I've entered into with you. So, you know, going through these agreements and identifying what those deliverables are um, falls under, under step two. And then if we step, uh, we flip to step three, you then need to assign a price to each of those deliverables to those performance obligations. So step two and step three are the hard parts and where we see um, organizations struggle. Again, this is where a lot of judgment comes into play, but the price would be what you would expect to receive for fulfilling that obligation um, or the transfer of goods or when you complete the service. So this does take into play the time value of money. It does take into play non-cash consideration. Um, and it could be variable, it could be fixed. So it doesn't always need to be consistent from one performance obligation to the next. We do have um, a note on here that just says that the amount does not include uh, amounts collected on behalf of third parties. So I know we're discussing nonprofits. You, you all are uh, majority tax exempt. You're not paying sales tax or, or other taxes. But if there was an instance where maybe there was a conference and you had sales tax um, in, in another state, this is an example of what we mean by amounts collected on behalf of third parties. So it does not, the guidance does say it specifically excludes um, things such as sales tax. So step four, um, which is important, it would be then to allocate the price. So you have this contract price and the whole contract is to take that price and then allocate it um, uh, to the various performance obligations based on what you would receive. And so if you have more than one uh, uh, revenue stream within a contract or more than one performance obligation, you do need to bifurcate that out. The guidance does give us uh, some specific, um, uh, where it says that you can take that price and base it off the standalone selling price. So I'll give a quick example because I think it's easiest to, to understand within the context of an example of a membership due. If you have uh, publications that you're giving to those members that are bundled with a bunch of other things that members give, if you sell those publications on the side to non-members for $10, the guidance says that you can apply that $10 price um, to the actual performance obligation. So I think that's, that's a helpful example when we're talking about how to allocate prices to the various performance obligations. And then finally, step five is to go ahead and recognize that revenue once you've transferred that good or um, perform that service. And um, this can be at one point in time, or as we've seen, and we'll talk about um, uh, specifically membership dues, it could be over a multiple uh, points in time. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Omid and Trevor to review the membership dues. So before we do that, let's talk, let's take another polling question and give you another CPE word. So does your organization, we just want to get a sense of um, who today with us has uh, membership dues that you believe will be required to bifurcate under topic 606. So go ahead and answer that. And while you all are answering the poll, I will give you the second CPE word, which is customer. Um, so customer is the second CPE word. Please do jot that down if you want to receive CPE credit. Uh, customer, C-U-S-T-O-M-E-R. And that's for people who haven't had their coffee this morning, so... Okay. No. Okay. So a lot of you aren't, um, don't either don't have membership dues or um, 
you know, don't feel that you have to bifurcate. That's okay because I think going through the membership dues actually is a great example and it gives you a lot of context on how you would apply it to even other revenue streams. So although it might not be um, a particularly applicable to your organization, I think it, it is going to be relevant in that it gives some great context on, on how to apply it. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Trevor and Omid. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, again, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see here on your screen, uh, here is our example for membership dues. Uh, you'll see that members pay $1,200 for annual membership, which includes two journals that are distributed in May and December mm -hmm. and free admission to the annual expo, which is held in March. John Smith became a member on June 1 of 2020 and paid the annual membership in full. The nonprofit has a calendar year in and it costs $200 to produce each journal and they charge $300 to non-members to attend their expo. Other various member benefits provided only to members are valued at $240. And if we can go to the next screen. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, so we're gonna give you the treatment under the uh, current gap and also the treatment under the new gap if 1606 is implemented. So as we all know, under the current gap, the journal entries are pretty simple. Uh, the cash comes in, so we debit cash for $1,200. The revenues have not been earned yet. So we credit deferred revenues dues also for $1,200 and then over the next uh, seven months, we, uh, we recognize the monthly revenue. So we credit use revenue for $100 each month. And of course we uh, reduce the balance in the deferred revenue account. So we debit deferred revenue dues also for $100 on a monthly basis. So as of year end, as we know, it's the calendar year, calendar year end as of 12, 31, 20, we have recognized seven months of dues revenue uh, totaling $700. And of course the balance in our deferred revenue account has gone down by the same amount. And now Trevor's gonna describe the treatment under the new gap. Thanks Omid. Again, upon receiving cash, you'll see that the, uh, the debit to cash is unchanged of $1,200. And you'll see uh, based upon the various performance obligations, it's now being broken out as opposed to just being deferred revenue for dues. Uh, you could see that you have the contribution revenue, and let's come back to that last, but let's take a look at the deferred revenue dues. And basically what that is, is the uh, member dues that have been uh, allocated based upon the example that we gave. If you can remember on the previous slide, we had mentioned that the other member benefits provided only to members are valued at $240. And continuing on, you'll also see that we have deferred, we can go back, thank you. If you go back, uh, you can see that the deferred revenue for the journals is at $400. Again, based upon our example, we have two journals and the cost to produce each journal is $200. So we have two times 200 gives us the $400 there. And the deferred revenue for the expo was $300. And again, in our example, we mentioned that the uh, cost to non-members to attend the expo is at $300. And the difference between all of those and the $1,200 cash outlay is the $260 uh, that is now being recognized immediately as contribution income. And continuing on, uh, the months through June through December, uh, you could see that we've now debited deferred revenue for dues of $20 and recognized dues revenue of $20. Again, that's the $240 divided by 12 over those months. And in December, you will see that we have now debited the deferred revenue for the journal because the journal has been uh, produced and provided to its members. And we would recognize $200 in journal revenue. And at 1231 of 2020, you'll see we have total contribution income of 260. Again, that was recognized upon receipt of the cash. 
we have dues revenue of 140. And again, that's the seven months at $20 per month and the total journal revenue of $200. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. So we're now gonna look at the journal entries that you're going to book for FY 2021. So we're now past the year end. Now, as we know, there was uh, $500 left in deferred revenues, deferred dues revenue as of 1231.20. And we had recognized $700 of the dues revenue in FY20. So now in FY21, we have five months left in the membership period. Uh, and for each month, we continue to recognize monthly dues revenue. So we continue to credit dues revenue for $100 and we debit deferred revenue dues for $100 on a monthly basis. So at the end of FY21, for that particular membership that we were speaking about, for FY21, we have recognized the additional dues revenue of $500 and the deferred revenue relating to that particular dues item that we were speaking about has reduced to zero. So the remaining dues revenue is recognized in FY21. And now Trevor's gonna talk about the new gap treatment. Thanks, Omid. Again, we're now in 2021, and you'll see for the months of January through May, we are now debiting the deferred revenue for the dues, again, of $20. And again, that's $240 divided by 12, and we'll recognize dues revenue of $20. And that'll be the same for the remaining months in 2021 for membership. In March, again, we have the Expo, so we'll recognize that revenue and that'll be a debit to deferred revenue for the Expo. And you'll see we have a typo and I was waiting, to, I was thinking whether or not I should tell you now or in the breakout session, see if anyone recognized that, but you'll see that we have journal revenue there for $300, but that should be actually be Expo. And in May, when the second journal is provided to the members, we would then recognize that $200 by debiting deferred revenue for the journal and recognizing journal revenue. And for 2021, you'll see we have the total dues revenue of $100, which again is that five months of $20 per month, the journal revenue of $20, $200, excuse me, and the expo revenue of $300. And that is it for this particular example. Great, so at this time, we're gonna go into our first breakout session and um, hopefully have some collaborative conversation. Um, so we hope that you all, if you don't have your cameras on, if you would please turn them on again, as Jen previously mentioned, but we really wanna have a place where we can have some conversations with you all amongst one another, instead of just us giving you a lecture. So Nathan will um, put us into those breakout rooms.
All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to see if anyone wanted to share some discussion from their breakout session on the membership dues. Sure, Jen, I'll share. I, one of the, the questions uh, that came up uh, during our breakout session was uh, the terminology uh, where we talked about an exchange and versus a contribution, whether it's reciprocal or non-reciprocal. So uh, uh, just to provide clarification to all of us uh, that are on the webinar, uh, when we uh, refer to uh, reciprocal transactions, uh, that is the equivalent of an exchange transaction. Again, where both parties are receiving something of commensurate value. Uh, conversely, uh, if you hear us talk about a contribution or a non-reciprocal, Again, that is when both parties are not receiving something of commensurate value. Yeah, great point, Trevor. Thank you. Anyone else want to share on their experience uh, with membership dues? I know we did. We talked a lot about uh, some of the organizations that do have members um, that have determined, um, you know, that those performance obligations are really satisfied over a period of time. And so they are recognizing those dues as they have been in the past, um, which is amortizing the over 12 months, the 112. So that was one example. And then um, I know we also talked about materiality um, that comes into play that if you have something that's uh, very immaterial that um, you don't necessarily wouldn't need to bifurcate and everything that we talk about here today and how you determine for your specific organization, you would want to make sure that whatever you decide, um, however you approach the uh, application of this, that it needs to be documented um, because ultimately that will be what uh, external parties, your auditors look for to justify. So um, we did talk, talk a little bit about that. Okay, let's move on. Um, so we will be going to uh, the sponsorships that Trisha and Walt will take us through those. We're gonna stop to do a polling question and give a CPE word before we dive into those sponsorships. So if we flip to the next slide. Um, so again, we just wanna get a sense of who is with us today that does have sponsorships for um, events and meetings for your organization. So take a moment to answer that. And the third CPE word is system. Um, so if you want to receive CPE credit, please do jot down the third word, which is system, S-Y-S-T-E-M. Okay, so, oh, so we have a lot of organizations that this next section will be applicable to. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Trisha Moll. Thank you very much, Jen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we have an example today on sponsorships. And it's interesting that 65% of you roughly uh, indicated that this is something that, that your organization uh, you know, would be applicable to. Uh, and, and we have here, um, you know, a funder pays 5,000 for a sponsorship of a golf tournament, which includes green fees and cart fees for four golfers, meals, beverages, and minimal entertainment. Funder pays the sponsorship in full in June for an August tournament. The non-for-profit has a June 30 year end. And the non-for-profit determines that the value of the green fees, cart fees, meals, beverages, and entertainment are 3,000. The sponsorship agreement stipulates that the fund would be returned if the tournament does not occur and therefore the non-for-profit does not fulfill its obligation or requirement 
in the agreement. Great. So, um, you know, when we when we talk about sponsorships, I think one of the big things here is, um, again, we talk about bifurcation under topic 606. So when we think about it, there's an exchange portion, there's commensurate value that's being given, you're getting to um, play golf, you're getting food, you're getting beverages. So how much of it is truly the exchange portion? We went over that in the, in the example, and we'll give you the answer um, <clears throat> that we've come up with. So what portion of that then is the contribution? And then how much would you recognize and when would you recognize the revenue? That's really what these um, new revenue recognition standards are all about. Uh, at what point in time have you actually earned the revenue or can you recognize the revenue? So going through this particular example, <clears throat> just to answer the questions that we've considered. The exchange portion, I think we all agree here just based on the very simplistic nature of this example is the $3,000 for the green fees, the cart fees, the meals, the beverage, and that entertainment portion of it. <clears throat> is any amount of that considered to be a contribution? Well, it's a total of $5,000. So the contribution element of that would be the remainder of the $2,000. When we think about the revenue recognition piece, this nonprofit is a June 30 year end. And again, if you remember from the example, we had talked about the tournament not actually occurring until August. So upon receipt, because we've determined that there's a $2,000 um, contribution here, um, this is actually an error because there is a repayment agreement. I apologize on this. It's just actually what we would consider to be a conditional promise to give. So from that standpoint, we would consider this to actually be a refundable advance and you would not be able to recognize that revenue until the event occurs. Um, so if we had gone back and we said, uh, no matter what happens, uh, the sponsorship is paid in full, the donor would not get any of that money back, but perhaps they can use it for a future event, much like what I think has been occurring with some of our clients in this virtual environment. I know I have one client that I work on with Trevor. Uh, pretty much all they do are golf tournaments, two golf tournaments during the year. The spring one was canceled. Um, with their June 30 year end, obviously back when COVID hit in March of 2020. Um, so that portion of it, they were able to push out and say, okay, we're gonna apply your sponsorship to a future event. So with that future event, we say, okay, it's still a contribution, but now it's just restricted, right? It's restricted until the related event has occurred. So it would be released at that point in time. So. That is kind of where we would walk through this process. We had some great examples um, in one of our, in our breakout room that I was in with Walt earlier that I would love. Hillary, I don't know if you'd be willing to share a little bit about what your particular example was, but I think it's important to touch upon it here and maybe it'll spark some conversation for the breakout room that we're gonna have after this. Yeah, sure. So my example was that I have a client that traditionally throws a gala. And so in the past, there was always bifurcation um, between the exchange that they were getting food and drinks and the contribution amount. So now that has gone completely virtual. So the question was, um, is there a bifurcation since they're not receiving food and drinks and dancing and, and any of that anymore? So I think that's a, a question we'll leave to talk about in the breakout room because I've I'm pretty sure almost every organization that has sponsorships is likely encountering this. Um, so, you know, just thinking through sponsorships, they can be for events, special events that you might have, much like the golf tournament, a gala, but also sponsorships come in way of, say, for associations with annual meetings, right? Um, when you have an exhibitor come out and pay an exhibitor's fee, that may not be 100% an exchange transaction and may fall under the realm of a sponsorship type of an agreement. So um, with that, I think we can go into our breakout rooms and hopefully have some conversations around this particular example. All right, welcome back everyone. Hopefully um, you all had some good discussions, especially with so many of you saying that you have events and um, we imagine that a lot have 
had events cancel and moved to virtual platforms. So would anyone like to share uh, some discussion points that they had within their breakout sessions? I, I can call on people. Well, Jennifer, one of the things that we spoke about was, uh, and this is a point that a uh, question that of course Trevor had brought up was, we have organizations where the uh, the, the member, sorry, this, the, the dues they pay uh, or the benefits they receive uh, and the dues they pay depends on the size of the organization. So the question was, you know, are they receiving the same benefit? Uh, do we assign the same value to the benefits they're receiving? And Amy's answer was that she had a client uh, with a very similar scenario recently. And the conclusion was that the, the benefits which, which the larger client uh, obtained were, um, were higher, even though perhaps uh, on paper, they looked like the, uh, the benefits were the same, but the value of the benefits they were deriving was higher simply because of the size of the organization. So I think that's an important takeaway for everyone. Yeah, and remember those um, transaction prices can be variable and they can be fixed. Um, so, you know, they can be variable with the size of the organizations and uh, you do need to look at that. And especially if you're talking about very large membership dues, um, you know, it, that, that could be very much material uh, to the organization for those larger dues, whereas they might be immaterial for the smaller organizations. So that's great. And Tricia, did you want to, I know we kind of talked about the question that you posed before. Um, did you want to, let's regroup and talk about, you know, what the answer is basically to having moved to completely virtual platforms for a lot of these organizations this year. Oh, you're, you're, oh, there you go. I muted myself instead of unmuted myself. Yes. Um, so in that example, if you recall, uh, Hillary was talking about the fact that previously it was supposed to be an in-person gala and they were going to receive all these benefits as under the sponsorship agreement. Um, but now it's just moved to a video. So there's not a lot going on. Uh, we did talk about in our particular breakout room, if there is um, any swag that may come, because obviously as a part of these virtual galas, a lot of things we've been seeing some of our clients doing is sending a little package uh, that maybe have uh, one little tiny bottle of wine for a wine tasting, uh, maybe some other types of uh, product propaganda that may come from other sponsors potentially, or maybe from the nonprofit organization itself. So, you know, we did quickly talk about the fact that there could be um, an immaterial amount of exchange or commensurate value. And again, just emphasizing to work with your auditors to kind of, you know, talk through if it's material enough to even be considered. Um, if there's a de minimis amount, uh, we know under the IRS rules, there is a de minimis amount. I shot out a number, but I'm not going to say it here because I'm not going to, I told everyone, don't quote me that that's the amount. Um, so from that standpoint, we talked about, okay, for, you know, there's not a lot of exchange transaction clearly going on now. Well, it turns into a contribution. So I think at the time uh, that you have basically agreed with your uh, sponsorships and you've said, okay, this is now how we're shifting it. That is the clear time where that recognition has changed. Um, so it now becomes a contribution. Your next question is, is it conditional or is it unconditional? Um, and so when we talked about conditional versus unconditional, some of the things that we as a group had discussed in the breakout room was whether that sponsorship agreement stipulated that the amounts would be refunded or not, as we mentioned in the previous um, example under sponsorships. So is it refundable or not? Can it be applied to a future event and basically just roll over? If it's applicable to a future event, we would say, okay, we're considering it that to be um, <clears throat> excuse me, an unconditional promise to give that is now just restricted for whenever that related event occurs versus, no, you have to have this event. If you don't have it now, whether it's virtual or not, you have to refund that money. We were saying there that that is considered to be a conditional contribution and would not be recognized until the event actually occurs as the contribution revenue. 
Yep. And, and we talked about exactly the same, that basically because the cost is almost non-existent anymore, is there really an exchange piece? And if not, then, you know, really does go into contribution. We didn't get into the conditional, but we did get into the restricted um, amount. So, you know, is this now just a contribution that's restricted and will be released at a, at a point in time? So um, great. Great to hear that, you know, everyone's... Uh, talking about consistent application of the, the new standards. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Um, we're gonna go to the exchange awards and program income. Um, before we do that, let's take another polling question and give another CPE word. So exchange transactions can be tricky, which we all know, that's why we're here trying to figure them out. Have you all analyzed the different types of contracts or program income your organization earns um, and how to apply? So go ahead and answer that question. And then our uh, fourth CPE word will be impact. So how this will impact your organization. I-M-P-A-C-T. So this is the fourth CPE word if you all want to get CPE credit. Um, okay, let's see. So yes, a lot of you have uh, started that analysis process on your exchange contracts and program income. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amy and Lindsay. Okay, thanks. Jen, so in this section, we're going over some examples of exchange transaction type awards or program income. And our first example uh, goes over a contract that's similar to what we're seeing with a lot of organizations where there's several different performance obligations wrapped into one. You know, it might have advertising, it might have attendance at a meeting, it might have even, you know, a contribution portion, um, all just in the same contract. So in this example, we have uh, December year end and they have a contract that includes $10,000 of advertising in the December issue of the magazine. They have $15,000 of attendance at the annual meeting that actually occurs after the end of the year. And they have a digital advertising package for a period of 12 months, that's $12,000. And let's just assume that the funds are being paid up front when they sign the contract, which is in June, 2020. So then on the next slide, we have just a quick look at the five-step process and we, we looking at step one and two um, and even three and four are pretty, uh, I would say clear cut in this example, you know, we listed the, the performance obligations, the prices are standalone prices. So there's not allocations that are occurring here. So I guess the tricky part here is looking at, you know, the parts of the contract and, and when are you going to recognize those, you know, is it at a point in time or is it over a period of time and then making sure that you um, consistently apply those. So we've determined that the December advertising and the meeting attendance are both uh, point in time. And on the other hand, the annual digital advertising package is something where it's over time and the benefits are consumed as they are um, provided over that 12 month period. Then on the next slide, we have the entries that would be associated with this transaction. Not going to go over all the details, but I think to point out, um, number one, they're, they're disaggregating their revenue into the correct category. So we have meeting registration uh, revenue and we have advertising revenue. So you're not gonna just have one line that says contract revenue as we might've seen in, in the past under the old gap. Um, you're making sure that keep them in the correct categories. And then the other thing is, as I had mentioned on the previous slide, you're recognizing the, the two obligations that are at a point in time you know, in December or March, respectively. And on the other hand, you're having the digital package that's over the course of the 12 months recognized um, basically one twelfth each month. So as of the end of the year, you are gonna have some deferred revenue uh, based on this transaction. And then you can go to the next example. Uh, this example is taking a look at how um, the organizations are measuring the progress towards the completion of those performance obligations. So this is an area that's, you know, one of the areas that you have a lot of judgment on. And so it gets a little bit tricky sometimes and there's different ways of doing it. So when you have a performance obligation over time, you have either the input method or the output method. 
This first example is looking at the input method. So we've got um, a nonprofit that's receiving some money from a pharmaceutical entity to do a trial for $100,000. And the budget for the trial is based on labor hours of total 500 hours to complete this trial. So in this example, the nonprofit is looking at the input method. They've determined that that is a, you know, a direct uh, relationship with the progress towards the performance obligation. And so at the bottom, you can see some examples um, of input method inputs. So labor hours, maybe costs incurred, um, things like that are pretty, pretty much common, I would say, for uh, nonprofit organizations. One thing to keep in mind here is that you're not including costs that don't represent uh, your performance. So for example, you might have an intern working on this project. You know, they're putting a lot of time in, but maybe not necessarily getting towards that completion. So you're not going to want to include that as your, as your input factor. Uh, so in this in this particular example, they've spent 250 hours on the project as of the end of the year, which is two and, um, half of the hours that were budgeted to complete that trial. So using the input method, they're going to recognize half of the contract at that point. Then you can move to the next slide. This is just, again, another quick look at the five-step process on this one. Um, one and two and three and four, again, are pretty clear cut in this one, but step five is what we're looking at with the input method to record the revenue based on the resources consumed. And again, the important part is that there is a direct relationship between the input and the progress towards your obligation. So make sure that you're documenting that if you do determine to use the input method um, or whatever method you decide to use. Then, yeah, you can move to the next example. This is a similar uh, idea, only looking at the output method instead of the input method. So when we're looking at the output method, we're, we're measuring um, things like milestones reach, time lapsed, or you know, maybe you're doing a survey to see how much has been completed to date. And you're using that to determine how much um, you should recognize at that point. So in this example, we have a research agreement with a government agency and the government agency is going to own the outcome. So when you looked at the first step of determining if this is a contract or you know exchange transaction or a contribution, they've said this is you know exchange transaction. And in this particular case, the the budget is for up to two hundred thousand dollars, and they're using a pre-approved billable rate. And uh, and I know we talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, so I'm just going to say that for this example, they're using the right to invoice practical expedient and the output method. And they've determined that that's going to correspond directly with the value that's delivered to the government agency they're working with. So when they're using this practical expedient, that allows them to basically um, bypass the determining the transaction price and the allocation steps and go right to uh, recording revenue based on what they have the right to invoice, which would be you know, the billable rate times whatever um, hours they've incurred in a particular, a particular month, for example. So that um, is something that you, you might want to consider um, when you're looking at contracts like this um, in your organization. So this slide goes again through the, the five-step process. And you can see the thing that's different here is that they've omitted those two steps based on using that practical expedient. And they're recognizing revenue based on the, the billable um, rate and the amount that they've incurred through that date. And this is a final example of a fixed price contract. And in, in this example, the organization is um, receiving a set amount per month to basically track some software usage and then they're providing reports um, monthly in addition to a summary report at the end of the six month period. And the question is how should they recognize the revenue in this instance? So it is over time. And in, in this instance, it looks like it should be recorded as they perform the services. The reasoning behind that is that the customers receiving that benefit, you know, as the consulting services are provided, um, and since they are receiving the reports monthly and, and on, on request in this example, another vendor wouldn't have to come in and reperform all the work to, to get to the remaining obligations. So on the next slide, I think it just has again the, the breakdown of the five-step process, and you know, as I just mentioned, they're recording it over time as they receive that benefit. There was one other um, example that kind of came up in questions as we were preparing for the, this webinar. And it was, you know, our organization is receiving a fee to process an application. 
and the question was, when should we re record that fee as revenue? Should it be when we when we collect the, the money up front, or you know, should it be when the review of the application is completed? And um, our thoughts on this are that even though the uh, the fee is non-refundable in this instance, um, we believe it it there is a performance obligation. So in this instance, I think it was for an accreditation that was being applied for. And um, they do you know, have to tell the customer, yes, you're accredited or no, you're not accredited. And there's resources that have to go into making that determination. So we felt that it really shouldn't be recognized you know, just when you receive the money up front. Um, you know, I guess we have to look at all the details, but it seems like if you have the obligation to provide the customer with an answer and it should be when that review is complete is what we felt. Um, so then the last couple of slides here, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit more in the breakout sessions, but the last couple of slides here have to do with just um, events being canceled and changed due to COVID and some of the topics that have come up as a result of that. So in the first slide we're talking about, you know, the, uh, I think this is the, I think the other one is the first slide. If you could go back one. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so could you go to slide 43? Yeah, so say the event's canceled, um, there's gonna be a couple options of what could happen. One, you could be obligated to return the whole fee to the registrant. Um, two, you could have the registrant donate the ticket or three, you know, you might be offering them the credit to a future event. So um, if you are providing the fee to the registrant, some of the factors to take into account are, you know, are you gonna, um, I guess, how are they providing that that request to have the refund? So maybe they're gonna, you're gonna communicate across the board. If you don't request the refund by a certain date, then we're gonna consider the situation. Um, in other instances, you might've had a no refund policy up front, And so they're not gonna provide a refund um, just because of the policy. So those are a couple of things that might've happened. You do wanna take into account the relationship with the donor or the attendee, of course, as you determine how to proceed with these. But um, if the ticket cost is donated, a couple of things that you want to remember are number one, you want to convert that to a contribution on your financials. It's no longer an attendance to the event. So make sure you record it in the correct revenue category or bucket. Um, and then also make sure you issue a, issue a receipt or a thank you as applicable for your, um, your policies and requirements. And then of course, if it's a credit to use at a future event, you're going to have that deferred until the, the future event or use might be uh, might happen. Okay, sorry, then you can go to slide 44, please. Okay, so this is a couple of things where some of our clients are having their event changed where maybe it's deferred into a future time. In other cases, the format might be changing. So maybe it was in person, now it's being held virtually, maybe it's um, one month period when it was just a one day event originally. So just things to keep in mind are, you know, you might need to go back through that, that process, especially step five to decide if you need to change how you're recognizing the revenue um, as a result of these changes that you have to the format of the event. And then finally, um, an example that's not really related to events, but maybe classes are if you had to extend your access to the client or the customer um, because of the COVID-19, again, just go back and reassess Make sure that you don't nothing slips through the cracks on um, recognizing the revenue in the appropriate amount of time. And I believe that's it. So we have another breakout room coming up right now. Some insight or share some examples from Jennifer. This. I'll share something. Thanks. Amy. That I think that I just that we had talked about or that I had brought up. I, I just wanted to point out that. As you look at these agreements, these contracts, um, I think it's important to note that sometimes they don't, they don't always say exactly what they may say grant throughout them or they may say contract throughout them. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly what they are. So you still have to really go through and review those and determine is there a true exchange transaction? And then is it a contract and fall under, under 606 and under these rules? Um, so sometimes that's even the, the the first step you have to take, and sometimes that's a difficult step to determine what exactly uh, the agreement is that you're looking at. 
Yeah, and we talked about um, the same thing, Amy, how a lot of organizations might have these agreements that haven't been looked at in years mm -hmm. and do not address, um, you know, this new standard. And so we've had several organizations have to go back to the donors and say, we need to rewrite this because it's not reflective of a grant. It's a reflective of a contract, even though what we're really doing is more grant and contribution like. So they've had to revisit contracts. Um, that maybe are very old and, you know, doesn't align with um, now what they need to, uh, in order to support revenue recognition. The other thing that um, James and our group brought up that is a great example of what we see a lot uh, happening a lot is with these contracts or sometimes, you know, you receive a big chunk of money upon signing the agreement. Um, and that's a great, uh, you know, example of a situation where the payment or the cash flow isn't going to align with your performance obligations and how you're recognizing revenue. So, you know, signing the agreement doesn't allow you to recognize the revenue of the hundred thousand dollars that you received, but instead, you know, you're going to have to go through and determine um, at what point in time, what are those performance obligations, and when to recognize that hundred thousand dollars um, that you've received up front. So I thought that was another kind of good example of uh, what we've seen in some other organizations. I have a question. I have a question. Among the conditions, we've got several contracts the US government, you know, where we um, do, do, do things of trials and we are looking for vaccines and so we're, we're doing some work. Um, but in, in the contract, Regardless if it's an exchange transaction or not, um, it's the contract anyway to say that we have to build the US government on a monthly basis based on the cost that we have incurred. So, does that really matter for the European Union? My European Union at the end of the day is the month, right? Whether it's a, it's a, that's an exchange transaction. Patrick, yeah, and Patrick, I know I, and we can touch base with you after. Um, you're breaking up, but we could barely hear um, what you were asking. But I think I heard something I heard on, something. on um, the fact that um, you have very defined um, uh, explanation that you're you need to recognize based on monthly invoicing. Was that? I think that right. was something that I heard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe you're gonna hear me better now because yes. I there you are. <laughs> um, so no, I was saying that uh, in our con the contracts, uh, all the contracts that we have with the U.S. government stipulate that we have to send a monthly invoice based on the, the cost that we have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we add our indirect costs and so, so on and so forth. Yep. So uh, my, my question is that does that really matter whether it's an exchange transaction or not? Not really, because at the end of the day, my revenue recognition is based on the invoice that I'm going to send them, right? Based on the expenses. So we're going to get into that um, next with Trisha oh. and Max on the grants. Um, but I'll say that I think, it, you know, Patrick, you're talking about a lot of federal grants um, that have conditions to recognition, to barriers. Um, and in that case, you know, you're recognizing based on the expenditures incurred. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next section. But yes, uh, you know, ultimately, those grants, those federal um, uh, agreements, uh, they do have that barrier, they are conditional, um, and you are going to just continue recognizing in the manner that that you have. So, so we'll talk about that. Thank you. All right, let's, um, let's switch over. I want to be mindful of our time. We've got one final session uh, with Max and Tricia. Let's take the polling question really quick and give you another CPE word. Um, have you all performed an assessment of your grant revenue to determine if the exchange transactions or the contribution rules apply? So exactly, Patrick teed us up nicely for this ne next topic. All right, while you guys are answering that, while you all are answering that, um, the fifth CPE word is grant, G-R-A-N-T. So jot down grants if you want to receive credits. 
And let's see the results from the polling. <clears throat> All right, so a lot of you have determined whether your grants are exchange versus um, contributions. So let's hand it over to Tricia and Max to take us through this in more detail. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, so I think we're going to touch on this very, very briefly. We've actually talked quite a bit extensively about this today. Um, I know we've talked extensively about this in our breakout rooms as well, but um, obviously we, were, we talked about topic 606. We, we've uh, kind of alluded to ASU 2018-08, which is the con clarifying the standards for contributions received and contributions made. Um, so this is just a nice slide that we put in here for you all to just even determine, does it follow the contribution rules or is it going to follow the exchange transaction rules? So it does have the current practice prior to the adoption um, you know, typically if, if it was an exchange, then you would talk about the direct commensurate value that is being given to that service provider. Um, if there are particular third parties that may be involved. And then you also want to talk about, okay, general public, is that really an exchange or a contribution? So that could, uh, in the current practice, fall under an exchange. Now we've got a clarification here that talks about and, and splits it out a little bit better for us, clarifies it a little bit more. Um, really, if it's benefiting the general public, think about federal grants, for instance. In the past, a lot of people, even though it was mostly dollar for dollar recognition, would consider that to be an exchange. Uh, transaction. Uh, now that's actually considered to be non-exchange because the general public is typically the one being benefited. It's considered to be a contribution that is conditional in nature. Um, so just a nice little uh, graphic for you to kind of help you with those different clarifying uh, standards here. So again, a uh, resource provider is not synonymous with the general public, even if it's a, a governmental entity. So that's one clarification that they've given to us. Um, making sure that the resource provider's mission is in something that's going to make them feel good. That doesn't mean that there's commensurate value now. Um, and again, the type of resource provider, whether it's the government, whether it's a private foundation, whether it is some other type of a like for-profit entity, does not override what the substance of the transaction means. Basically, again, just because it's the federal government doesn't mean it's exchange. Just because it's a for-profit entity doesn't mean it's consulting income. Um, so you really have to dive into the actual agreements in order to determine whether it's a contribution or an exchange transaction. Yeah, I, that's a that's a great point to pick up on. Uh, you know, you really have to evaluate the substance of the relationship with the resource provider under the agreements to determine whether you're going to go with 606 or you're going to uh, recognize based on the contribution rules. So just to quickly run through kind of what that evaluation looks like in either case, exchange or non-exchange. Uh, so you've already completed step one. You've, you've identified a contract, assuming it's an exchange. So then you have to identify the performance obligations. And, and this is, of course, subject to judgment. But but generally speaking, the performance obligations are, are going to be things that are met at a point in time, uh, such as deliverables or milestones in the awards or over the course of time. Uh, if, if those obligations are met at a point in time, such as meeting those milestones, you assign a value to each one and recognize the revenue when those obligations are achieved. If, if the obligation is met over the course of time, you, you recognize uh, revenue in a manner to reflect progress towards that. So that could be based on your expenses incurred. It could be based on the level of effort or time, uh, or, or it could even be in some cases equally over the term of the agreement, if that can be justified. So that five-step process is open to interpretation, but, but the important thing is you document it. Um, and uh, if you don't have commensurate value uh, on the next slide, you get a little bit into the ASU 2018-08. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly kind of summarize that. Um, so you, you've, you've gone through your initial evaluation, you've determined that this is not an exchange, uh, and then you have to ask the question, so, so now you're in the contribution rules, and you have to determine next, is it a conditional or an unconditional award uh, to, to be conditional? There's two criteria that, that, that have to be met, both of them have to be met. So you're looking for barriers, which are things like time limitations, specific outputs, uh, specific events that have to occur, specific guidelines about, about how you use resources or incur expenses. Uh, and then there's also the right of return that needs to be included, meaning the, the donor or the resource provider can, can ask for the funds back uh, at, their, at their sole discretion. Um, and, and if there's a question there, the, the, the guidance kind of defaults to saying that if the donor stipulations are, are unclear, um, that, that you kind of go back to, to the conditional. So you're safer that way. Um, and then, you know, once the conditions met, you recognize revenue uh, uh, 
into either with or without restrictions. Uh, so you still have to make that determination as, as has always been the case. Um, and you know, final thoughts on the decision tree. I think it's important that you go through the analysis, document your decisions. Uh, don't wait for your auditors to ask you to do this. Um, you know, if you have it documented, you're much less likely to have, have questions or pushback on the methodology that you've adopted. And so we have a, a couple of quick examples to go through to kind of illustrate uh, this analysis. Uh, the first one here, University A is awarded a grant from the federal government. Uh, they're required to follow rules and regulations established, established by the OMB. There's uh, certain rules about the cost they can, that it, they can incur, and, and the purpose is to submit research findings to the government. Um, but the university is going to retain the rights to that research, and also any unused assets or, or unallowed costs um, must be refunded. Uh, so we ask, does this look like an exchange or a non-exchange? I think pretty clearly this is a non-exchange uh, because the, the federal government, the resource provider, uh, while they get to review the product, they don't retain the benefits to it. The benefit is incidental to, to the federal agency. And so then you ask conditional or unconditional. Well, well to me, I, I would make the argument that this is conditional, uh, that they talk about a right of return. And, and uh, you know, there's also some barriers there in terms of how you have to incur the expenses. You have to fulfill certain requirements. Um, so Trisha, I'll let you go through to the next one. Thanks, Max. Right, and so just kind of in conjunction with the last one, um, this one, the, the college is getting money from a state government to perform a particular research on solar energy is what we decided to choose. But in this case, the, um, the college is required to do a lot of the same things. They have to plan the study that they perform, perform the research, um, submit that research back to the local government. But unlike the last example, in this one, the state government is actually retaining all the rights to the study. So it's no longer going to be out there and available for the general public. So just going through very quickly again, what we've already talked about here, um, you know, I think you all can conclude that this is considered to be an exchange transaction. There is a reciprocal or commensurate value that's being um, given in return and the benefit is going to the state government. Um, so with that, being mindful of time, we're actually going to skip this next breakout room. I think we've talked extensively about all of the different types of um, uh, revenue streams that fall under these different topics that we've been discussing all day. So with that, Jen, maybe the last poll. Okay. Yeah, let's let's jump into the last polling question, Nathan. Um, so we, we do hope today was helpful and relevant. Um, we want to hear back from you to see if you feel like you have some additional tools that you can take back to your organization to apply these principles. While you're answering that, I want to give you the final CPE word, which is mission, um, M-I-S-S-I-O-N, mission is the final CPE word. And uh, I'll, I'll mention this again at the conclusion, but we're going to go ahead and put the CPE survey um, in the chat box. Uh, so you can click on it there. And then you can also, we'll, we'll follow up with an email and it'll be in, in a follow-up email as well. So, oh, it's so great. We feel uh, useful today um, with 96% of you saying that uh, we've given you some good tools to bring back to your own organization. <clears throat> All right, so just a couple of things to conclude the presentation that uh, we wanted to mention. There are a couple practical expedients out there for you all to elect um, when applying this new standard. And uh, so this right to invoice was actually something that Lindsay mentioned when uh, she was going over her slide and, and the output method. And so um, with this, you can actually skip uh, steps uh, three, four, and five. Um, you, can you only need to complete steps one and two. So basically, it's saying that uh, an entity has a right to the amount that it's invoicing. So here, it's very straightforward in the example that we've, we've given you. Um, in other words, it, the consideration or your revenue is equal to the amount that you have invoiced. So an example would be for an hour, hourly service contract. So you've um, uh, hired an external accountant at an hourly rate, or let's say you're a management company providing uh, management fees 
Um, and that invoice amount is based on uh, the hour of labor and any other expenses. So this practical expedient says that you have the option to elect that you're going to recognize revenue based on that the basis of the invoice amount. So again, that, that output method that Lindsay mentioned. The next item, um, very straightforward. Uh, I think we've covered this a number of times. Uh, so a portfolio of contracts. So the practical expedient does say those similar contracts. You don't need to analyze them um, on an individual basis. If they are substantially the same and materially consistent with one another, you can group them together um, and analyze them together. So the example that we threw in here that's easy to uh, wrap your head around is, um, is those membership agreements, those membership dues contracts and saying that if the members in this category are all basically receiving the same thing, you can analyze that whole category together. And I know Amy had brought up that we have an organization where um, it's the opposite, that their membership categories are very different in the, the benefits that they're receiving. And so in that case, you wouldn't want to analyze them all together. Um, but if there is the instance where it's basically all the same, you know, you don't need to go through each varying level of, of membership tier um, if benefits are substantially the same. So the disclosure requirements, um, one of the bigger changes in your audited financial statements for organizations that are adopting, uh, this is one thing that we see is impacting you all. Um, even, you know, even if you determine that it's not material, whatever the case may be, the disclosures are going to change within your financials. Um, so the first item on here, the disaggregation of revenue. So you do need to break out the different types of revenues now, either on the fi face of your financials, or you can do it within the footnotes. Usually it's um, within that uh, statement of activities and change in net assets or your income statement. But you do need to break out your revenues. So we have a lot of uh, organizations that like to put on their grants and contracts um, on their income statement. Well, that no longer, you can no longer group them together. If you're really saying that they are contracts, they're being treated differently than maybe some of your, your grants or grants, contributions, and contracts. That, that one line item will no longer fly. So do be prepared uh, this year if you have uh, presented them together in the past that we will, your auditors probably will be asking for the disaggregation of those revenue streams. So within the footnotes, you also need to include those performance obligations um, and how you are satisfying those performance obligations. And then any significant judgments that have gone into determining um, the timing, the amount, the variability of your consideration and, and how those things are, re are recognized. And accordingly, you know, updating your accounting policies is of utmost importance um, because that is what we will look to to say you are complying with the new standard. Um, so let's flip to the last slide. So here we just have a very high level, um, you know, how you would approach going about adopting and, and in practicality what you would do to implement this new standard. So reading the FASB, I'll tell you um, the hundreds of pages of documentation, you know, if there was a Cliff Notes version, I'd, I'd be all over it. Um, but any of you that uh, want to be a uh, and pioneers and read the whole FASB document, it is there. Um, otherwise, we'd say you're doing the right thing, coming to trainings and educational events that really aim to break down that hundreds of pages of documentation to, to how it might be particularly relevant within your organization. Assign someone to become an expert, you know, don't don't assume that everyone's going to know everything about this, but having one person to spearhead it uh, certainly makes it much easier. Review all your grants and contracts. This is something that I mentioned before that a lot of organizations have had 
to do um, because they haven't been looked at in a long time and they're not they're not reflective of what's happening in practice or the the substance of what's occurring within practice or what they feel um, the the ultimate deliverables are. So it might be a good time to get with your legal counsel or um, uh, you know your your finance or CEO or a COO staff and review all those grants and contracts to make sure they're reflective of of what you intend to do as far as revenue recognition. And number four is once again, by far the most important is the documentation of all of this. You know, we've walked into a lot of organizations that say, yes, I've adopted it. And then we have no documentation um, to say how they've adopted it or what they've changed or what they haven't changed because it's immaterial. That's fine too. Um, you know, if you did make that determination, absolutely fine. Uh, we just need it documented. So I think that's that's pretty important. Training the staff and where we see this come into play is um, because this is very much an accounting and finance uh, piece where we see this uh, being applicable is that the grants uh, department and the contracts department, your program managers who might be handling um, these grants and entering into these agreements, they really need to be brought into the loop because it's going to bridge the gap between what the accounting and what the program and grants managers and personnel think um, is actually happening in practice. So I think it's important for the accounting and finance team to also um, be in communication with your grants and programmatic personnel on this, on this change. And then update your policies and procedures. So your accounting manual, your policies and changes to, to revenue recognition. Um, chances are they haven't been looked at in a long time because there haven't been significant changes to revenue recognition in a long time. Um, so now this is a great opportunity to, to take a look at that um, within your organization. And with that, I just want to say thank you all. Um, we provided our, our contact information here, should you all have any questions. And certainly on the previous slide, um, we'll, uh, in the beginning, uh, our marketing team's email, um, should you need any further information. Uh, we visit our website. We have a lot of webinars, upcoming events. Uh, please do remember to take that survey if you want CPE credits, um, and we'll get that out to you. But thanks to everyone. We had some great discussions, some great real-life examples, and uh, very pleased to see that 96% of you were satisfied. So thank you, everyone. Take thank good care. You. Take care now. Bye-bye.